million of migrant workers and they don't speak Bangla. So if the government here allow the children to be admitted in the schools, it will be no good for them. Thus, we sort of came with an idea, so let's bring the school to the children. We decide to open schools inside Brickfields. And so the children now are, will be able to get their schooling. At the same time, of course, many of them will continue to work because they're badly paid. But at least the beginnings have been made. We can't go in immediately and start talking about don't employ child labor. Because, you know, people will reject immediately and then you're cut out altogether. And he opened around 20 schools, and five in South Chobish Parvana, five in uh, Hugli, and ten in Howrah. And around 1150 children are studying in these schools. 38 teachers are involved in this project. Two other groups that we have got involved with. One are the Sunlap group. Now Sunlap is an organization, an excellent organization. It brings back the children from the trafficked areas. See, education is important, but many of these children did not, uh, it did not happen to them. Uh, their families did not uh, think about it. They, did, they themselves, you know, they did not think about it. Many of these girls ran away or were given in marriage when they were very young, and then they were trafficked into prostitution or they in, uh, even in uh, brothel prostitution. You know, they're picked up by police, and then, but when they come back, the parents don't want them, the families don't want them, and the police don't want them to go back because they say they'll be recycled, re-trafficked. So these are girls who are locked up in Shanlap in, in a very protected environment. And we got involved in this because the chief, uh, the chief secretary of West Bengal told them to come to me for advice about education. Anyway, the end of, of it is that they now have about 25 children, girls from that um, red light, I mean trafficked background. They're now coming into regular school, attending our regular classes with the intention of being prepared for open school. These girls, when they come to us, they are generally between 13, 14, 15, that's the age group we get. And that is the time, you know, they start going to school. So, open school was the only answer uh, for our girls and we consulted uh, Sister Cyril. And hopefully we will have maybe 10 or 12 of them next year, we will try for their open school and get through. And they'll come back and they'll do class 12. Now they have their uniform and they have their, you know, uh, shoes and bags and water bottle and throughout the day they are there going in a bus, coming back in a bus and it adds to their self-confidence which adds to you know they are doing well. So we are really very grateful and the other area was the red light area where Terra Day's arm began working with the red light people to try and stop this trafficking also and uh, as part of that they found out that the children were not being sent to school so uh, because they were being um, discriminated against in their own areas. They were being, um, you know, told, oh, you're prostitute children, you sit separately, don't come here, and so on. So nobody wanted to go to school. So they said, can you help us? I said, yes. All you do is shove them in our gate at 8 o'clock every morning, and we will send them out from here, relabeled Loretta Rainbow children. They don't have prostitute written on their foreheads. So we have done that. Now, as a result of that, the Terra des Hommes bought us three lovely big yellow buses and so that we could bus the children in every morning and take them back in the evening. And um, the best of it all was that they made us owners of the buses. So the buses belonged to us, and they gave me some money to help to run them. Now, our most recent situation is that the Terra des Hommes are pulling out. They are not going to continue with the anti-trafficking program, so they're also pulling out from the schooling. They won't support the schooling anymore. But I have written to the people, the red light people, to say, um, we will continue. We will send the buses for your children and we will bring your children into school and we will keep them. And as they grow up, the girls, as they get older and become interesting to the clients of the red light areas, then they can come in as boarders. Still, uh, this school seems to cater to every possible group, but there's another group of old people. Now these are very pathetic because they're abandoned on the side of the street all around the station and they're told by their families, we'll come back for you. So they sit there chained by love that little spot where they are, terrified to move in case by chance the family comes and they lose the connection. And if someone throws them a little bit of food, well and good, otherwise they just slowly starve to death. 
So our children go out every day around one o'clock. The children have just come in off the street, our little rainbows not yet put into school, but just preparing. They go back out and they take with them 42 lunches. And they serve those lunches to these poor people, sit down with them, chat with them like they talk to their grannies. And in this way, in a way, the cycle is complete because these children have come from the streets themselves. Now they go back to help older people who are in very great need. And then we have two homes outside of Calcutta. Here we try to invite these old people to come. It's very difficult to persuade them because they would prefer, they're always terrified, as I say, that their family will come and they lose the connection. But the family never comes. It's a, it's a wonderful thing that schools are taking up this challenge, and especially Loretto Sialda is a pioneer to take up such a project. We have old age homes and there are, for social work, maybe children are visiting old people once in a year or twice in a year. But to get on a first-hand experience by going out to the station, feeding them, caring them, talking to them and sharing their lives is something that is very unique in Loreto Sialda. Now regarding the normal school, the regular school which is really the core of this entire enterprise, uh, that regular school as we've said already have 50% children from the slums and 50% from well-off families. But all are chosen on a lottery system so there's no academic entrance test. So unlike in many schools where the academic entrance test will obviously favour the well-off child who's had a tutor to prepare her, uh, whereas the poor child will appear very, very poor, a very low academic standard. Here everybody comes in on the same um, gamble, if you like, on the same lottery. So we get a wide range of abilities, even among our well-off children. We haven't creamed off the best brain. However, I often say to people here in Calcutta, it's amazing that since we take our children by lottery and we don't cream off the best brains, that our results are roughly comparable to everybody else in the city. We have had only one failure in my 30 years in this school. Otherwise, everybody gets through. Majority, more than 50% with first class, about maybe 35, 40% with second class, and just a few stragglers in third class. Now we have special children who would be mentally handicapped, Down syndrome and so on. Now they have their own special teacher, but they are all of them uh, um, related into a class, a regular normal uh, class. What happens with these children is they go for an hour to their special teacher and she checks them and sets them up for the day. And then they go off with all their work up to their regular class and they belong to a group. And all our teaching in all our classes is done in groups which facilitates learning much more, much more than in straight lines. So the group that they belong to then helps them with their lessons and sees that they do it while they go on with their own studies as well. Among these children also, apart from the mentally handicapped kids, we also have children who get pushed out from other schools. Many, many schools, in spite of all my efforts as Secretary for Education for the Archdiocese to prevent this, children get pushed out of school if they fail twice. Even if they fail, even if it's not in the same class. But once they fail twice, they're out. And the principals who push them out never ask, where will this child go? So, in other words, some other school should take charge of, of the, our failures. Now, I believe that if we have failures in our school, we are responsible. So therefore, we keep our own failures and we provide uh, remedial work or remedial classes or whatever is necessary to encourage them and to get them on. We also have an open school section where they can move over if they don't want to do maths and things like that, and where they can take the exam at their own pace. But in addition to that, we also receive a lot of rejects, if you like, from other schools, failures. I have got 26 students in my class. Many of them have joined in the class this year itself. They are mostly students who are coming from schools outside uh, our school, and most of them have done very badly. They have failed twice or thrice and their schools do not want to keep them anymore. And the children are about 12, 13, 14 years of age and they cannot be slotted to any particular class because of their age right now. So we have put them all together into this class where I'm trying to give them a consolidated knowledge so that they can prepare themselves for the open school exams. Now they have come into Loreto Shialda, they are a part of the school, they are participating in all the other activities and they have become like other normal kids and they are doing well now, they are getting good marks and that gives them that extra enthusiasm to work even better. So this value education and this human rights, this is also part of our whole ethos in the school. 
and our children are learning their values not by what we teach them and preach to them, but by what they actually practice. See, they see things like equality in the school. They see even the very poorest people are invited into the office. They see the gate wide open, anybody come in, anybody can have access to me, to the teachers. Um, they, they themselves are going out into the villages, they are talking to street children, and all on a basis of equality. They're brought up on the realization that our constitution in India guarantees equality to everybody. The program on human rights education was initiated in uh, 2006. Uh, it is a three-phase module. Module 1, which deals with the introduction of human rights education, is to be done with class 6. Module 2 deals with child rights, is to be done with class 7. And module 3 deals with discrimination, which is supposed to be done with class 8. So you cannot discriminate between one and the other. And you may not make judgments on people because of clothes or because of any of those other external factors and even internal factors either. All are equal. Similarly, even our bearers and our uh, domestic staff, our support staff, they all wear the same uniform. All of our people, whether they're sweepers or whoever they are, help to cut up vegetables in the morning. So these are ways by which we propagate values of equality. And freedom, the children are very free because there's no oppressive rules for them to keep. And everything is reasonable. We reason everything out with them. We employ logic rather than force, if you like. So they know if there's a rule, the reason why the rule has been made, and hopefully, mostly they cooperate and do with it. So our value systems, love, sincerity, justice, and freedom. The child who is loved has the capacity to be sincere, has the courage to be sincere, and um, also becomes free because she knows she's loved, she knows she's cared for. And then she can be just to other people, she can be fair. This is a very important aspect of our whole setup. JPIC stands for Justice, Peace and Integrity of Creation. We take up different issues which are linked with the Millennium Goals. Education is the, really the answer to everything. But it has to be a different kind of education. Not the education where the children are just brought in, sat down with their books and trained to get the highest possible uh, result and the highest possible degree and off to America or England on a scholarship and never come back. That, that is not what I hope for. What I hope for is that by this kind of education which we give them, where we are exposing them to real issues, it's not just simply that they're running out to the villages. Yes, they're going out to the villages every, every week. But we are also, through our value education and our um, ju social justice and our human rights education, we are getting them to reflect on that experience. So when we talk about social justice and we talk about rights, we have an experience on the part of the children to relate that to. It's not a sterile lecture in a, in a, a two-dimensional classroom. It's something that they have actually lived through. When they've gone up and they've listened to a child up on the, on the rainbow program who has possibly been raped, that makes an awful lot of difference. When they talk to these traffic girls from Shanlap and we ask them to share, what, for me, what does being a girl mean? Uh, they're listening to the stories. They're getting a whole huge dimension vision of life which they would never get in a normal school. So this kind of education, and it has to be an education which is woven into the regular school. It's not some, something separate. It's a part of the entire lot, everything. People sometimes look at us and say, oh, very good social work. This is not social work, this is education. It's education for the future, education to, um, for social transformation. And we won't uh, transform the world by telling the children what to do. It's by giving them this hands-on uh, sort of acceptance and this hands-on experience that then they become, they be, really become, uh, what should I say, initiators of change in their own areas. All around me are all ex-students come back to the school as teachers. And I've taught many of them. Many of our people who have come through the school now have come back to work with me as teachers and as um, helpers in various, in various support situations. Now, how does all this get carried along? We look for sponsorships. Uh, some people locally give us sponsorships, the Hong Kong Bank, for example. 
I am personally a great fan of uh, Sister Cyril and the wonderful work she does. I'm not the only one. There are countless number of people in West Bengal who have benefited from the good work she does. Uh, this is something which has been recognized widely by the nation also, by a very grateful nation, which has given her the Padma Shri Award, a very well-deserved Padma Shri. So HSBC as a professional organization does not just go on the basis of personal uh, admiration or feelings. It also has to ensure that whatever support we provide translates into the required benefit for the people it is intended for. In this case, children from underprivileged backgrounds, children from slums, and uh, children from the street. And that is what we have seen happening in a very effective manner. And then um, people like, for example, say we had a little Sabu who had a hole in our heart. And we, as Teresa approached uh, Dr. Colonel Sarkar in the um, Rabindranath Tagore Hospital, and they carried out that operation free. And she like had a hole in the heart, which uh, would uh, be a very incapacitating thing for her to have for the rest of her life. Uh, we fixed this hole in her heart and it's been a gift of life, not from us, but from Sister Cyril and her colleagues in the letter Sianda, because if not for them, uh, these uh, people who are not as well off as most of the others are, would have never seen the light of day in terms of getting uh, expensive tertiary heart treatment. So each one of these is ways by which slowly, slowly we collect money and we utilize it. And not only do we support all the stuff that's happening here, we also have um, our small village schools in Panigata, Loreto, uh, up in uh, Saddam, away in Lole, out here in Takapuka, where the children are too poor to be able to pay fees. I have children here who will not have a birthday uh, party, well-off children, whose parents will come in to me and say, she doesn't want a birthday party, she wants the money to go for the poor children. Then you have at Christmas, we have the we give out about 1,500 parcels to the very poorest children. The junior school teachers get the uh, parents um, to donate back the little the clothes because little children grow very fast. So they get all the donations back from the parents. 